a little better, eh? Fog's leaving. That's looking up the Pembroke Valley towards uh, Mount Meager. Meager Mountain. If you want to Google that one up. It's a volcano, dormant volcano. Actually, there's a massive slide up that sucker a few years ago. And, uh, there's, I know of three different hunters. There's a popular deer wintering zone right below me on this side, right down this timber here. Three different guys I know from town here had experiences of these things down there. Then uh, straight up on the hill above me right here is where Sarah and I found tracks last spring. Yeah, more people. Well, it might be Christmas right now, possibly. Christmas Day, if you're hearing this. I'll see if I can manage to um, preload this so it launches in. Just so a lot of you know, I'm not, I'm not going out and doing this every single day, all right? Um, I go out and I'll, I can manage to read about five, I think, max, maybe four in one go. And then, uh, and then get them thrown down on a, a video and load up the YouTube all in one go and then you can preload these so they launch at a, at a preset date all right so that's what's been going on and then uh, I understand a handful of these have been getting a few stories have been reread and uh, just so you know you know I got a lot on the go man and this isn't a career okay I haven't been trained to do this um, I don't punch into work and do this every day for somebody who's supervising me and and telling me how to do it this is all uh I don't know how this came about. It just, it just come about. I'm doing it. It's helping a lot of people. And um, there's thousands and thousands of emails. What I have been doing is I, I read an email, almost. I'll make sure it's somebody's experience and not a question or, or a, you know, lots of people email me for various things, and I'll see that it's a, an experience they want shared. I'll copy it. I'll paste it into a folder my I made on my phone, for each month. But now what I found, what I've been doing, how I've been screwing up is. I'll have a, like December, December's got, I don't know, three or four hundred, three hundred and something um, experiences in in the folder. And then I'll go out, and you know what, what I got to go through most of the time to get to some of these places, you know, I'm four-wheel driving, backpacking, whatever, it's snowing, raining, I'm hunting, and then I quickly decide I'm going to blast with some of these emails, and I whip out the phone, open up the folder, read them, go on the next one, read it, read it, read it, phone dies, battery dies, whatever, carry on. But what isn't happening is I'm not labeling them as red. I'm not putting them in a separate folder as red. I don't, I'm in too much of a rush. It's, I can barely pull this off as I can, all right? So the odd time there's gonna be the odd, the odd reread, it's gonna be a mistake, but big deal. It's free and it's painless, right? So I guess what I should be doing is um, making a folder for each day of the month and label it that way that I do it and make sure I read every single one of them because I'll read a handful out of December and then maybe when I'm sitting there doing nothing under a tree or whatever hunting and I'll sometimes I'll crack up my emails and then I'll see more emails and then I add them into the folder and they get stacked on top of the ones I read and then that's how it gets um, messed up and then I go back in there a couple days later read one by accident <laughs> and carry on so there you go how's that for a little bit of an opener ramble but anyway uh, I'm going to read a few to you right now. All right. Hi, Steve. I've subscribed. I've been watching your YouTube videos for a while now and friended you on Facebook. Facebook. Here's another one for you guys. Facebook. I don't go on Facebook. Very, very, very rarely. My Instagram posts are all hunting angling related and they're automatically are linked to Facebook and they, they, uh, go to Facebook when I post on the on the Instagram, and the odd time I'll go onto that Facebook page where I post it, and I'll copy and paste it and, and forward it to the Blacktail Deer Hunter Facebook page or wherever, where there's literally tens of thousands of people. But um, other than that, I don't go on there, you guys. So even if you've made it to the friend list or you follow one of the pages, if you comment or ask me a question there, it's not going to get read. I'm sorry, but it's just not. I don't have time for Facebook. And once you understand what Facebook is really doing, it's very stress. It's very frustrating on how to pull your pages from there and dump that prick all together but there's so many thousands of people enjoying the content the pages that you created so it's it's a bit of a uh conflict there but 
We'll see what's coming in the future. I'm creating some brand new items that's coming and it's going to solve all anyway, but that's a little more news for that in the new year. So there's uh, what happens on my Facebook, you guys, okay? Just so you know. I love how you're giving others a safe place to land with their stories. I've noticed that so many of them are about scary encounters, fear-based, and that people seem to want to give their backgrounds up front to possibly let us know either their capabilities or lend credence to the stories. I wish I could say that I've been an avid hunter or was raised in the woods, but I have no real backstory like the others. I do have a story, though. It's just not quite like the others I'm hearing in your videos. I'm just an ordinary woman, mother and grandmother, who had an extraordinary experience. In 1980, in Decatur, Illinois, at about 3 a.m., my insomniac self was standing at my living room window, looking out my backyard. It was winter, no snow, but the ground was frozen and glistening in the light of the full moon. My yard was level for several yards and then sloped down. We had three beagles who, we had three beagles who were barking and yipping in a way I'd never heard before, but they were at the bottom of the hill and I couldn't see them. I became aware of a being walking from around the back corner of my house. At first I thought it might be a neighbor looking for his horse again, but seemed to like escaping and coming to our house. I was pondering why I'd be wearing such a big silver gray full length full fur coat though. As he got even with me, my brain struggled to make sense of what I was really seeing. Not my neighbor. My house was a tri-level, and my window was at the second story level. I was looking straight down at this being, who was only about three yards away from my house. It was so clearly visible in the light, that full moon and even partially lit from a light in our back de side deck. It stopped, turned its upper body and head, and looked straight up at me like it knew I was there standing in a darkened room. Apparently I was visible to him as he was to me. I clearly saw his face and even his expression. He looked a little puzzled, as I'm sure I did, also. I saw no aggression, nothing, except a kind of thoughtful or curious expression. We stared at each other for at least a full minute. <laughs> That's a long time. And then he turned and walked down the hill toward the dogs. I was afraid he would hurt or kill them. That was only one of the thousand thoughts racing through my mind. I lost sight of him, and then my dog suddenly just shut up. I just knew they were dead. I wasn't about to wake now. I wasn't, I wasn't about to wake my now ex-husband. He wouldn't believe what I'd seen, and he'd go busting out there to see what was really happening. I just stood frozen and kept watch for over an hour. I didn't see him, it, again. The way he was headed would have taken him down a stream into a wooded area behind a property. The next day I found the dogs were just fine, and there's no proof of what I'd seen, no footprints, etc. A quick half-assed measurement of a tree branch that this thing had ducked under as he walked showed me that he had to be over eight feet tall. I didn't tell a single soul what I'd seen. Nobody I knew would have believed me. Cops would have been useless and I had a good laugh. Cops would have been useless and had a good laugh. Instantly I remembered the story of the big muddy river monster from years earlier where I grew up in southern Illinois. Someone I knew actually saw that one. Now I've seen his cousin. I carried the weight of that event for years. Ended up telling only three people. Only because it's stuff, only because this discussion came up. <clears throat> Not one of these people asked me any questions, and the subject got changed. Then in 2012, 32 years later, I happened upon the BFRO website and read of two other encounters in the same town where I'd had mine. I decided to report mine to that site. I was contacted by a researcher and related my whole story. It felt so good to finally get it out and be believed. I know now that some people from that org are under fire, but this man should never be. He has helped me immensely through several communications over the years now. To make a long story even longer, I had another possible event, audible, not visible this time, in about 2014 or 15. Sitting by a partially open window one evening, something screamed so loud right outside my window that I think my heart actually stopped for a second. Not a screech owl, not a bird of any kind. Almost human, but louder than any human could ever scream. I couldn't even react. I sat frozen again. Didn't look, didn't move, just sat there for probably five or six minutes, waiting to hear footfalls from someone, something, walking away. Not one more sound. I then can't... Con I then calmly got up and left the room, hoping whatever it was would be watching me 
and maybe just think I was deaf or something. I locked myself in the bathroom and just shook for about 15 to 20 minutes, then flipped every light outside on. I saw nothing. Our house was up a quarter mile lane surrounded by flat fields. No cars. No car as far as I could see. Plus, I would have heard one if it even got within a mile of my house. I knew this was no human, though. My gut told me so. I got on the internet and listened to every bird and animal sound, trying to match up what I'd heard. It didn't exist. Not until I started listening to Bigfoot sounds as a last resort. I found it. No mistake. Why the H was I singled out again? I'm not that special for crying out loud. I admit to some psychic ability sometimes, but I wouldn't call myself a psychic. And I'm certainly not obsessed with them. And I hadn't moved away from the first location. And I had moved away from the first location. And it had been years and years since that first one. Maybe they have friends at the post office who shared my change of address with them. Do they call each other and target certain individuals? Makes as much sense as anything else. And nothing else does. What the hell? Why do certain individuals have more than one experience and others who search for years have encounter, have no encounters? There has to be a reason, but what? The next day I noticed that both of our big full garbage bins were knocked over sideways, lid still closed. There had been no wind, and a car couldn't have hit them where they were. These aren't like the ones in town. My house was in the middle of nowhere in the country, and these things are huge, and so bottom heavy that I can't even knock them over. The only other house within a mile was on the other side of a huge pond. These neighbors didn't even have curtains on their windows because they were so isolated there. I called my neighbors to see if they had heard or seen anything unusual the night before. Nope. Except their three inside dogs woke them up barking, which they said had been happening lately, but they just figured it was a raccoon or other animal outside and didn't bother to look. The same researcher I later talked to suspected this thing was probably a juvenile drawn to their house first because of no curtains, and that they're so curious, and that maybe, since I didn't react to its scream, which might have been meant to scare me, it turned over the garbage bins. I realize that's all suspicion, but whatever screamed that night was not any kind of animal or human in the state of Illinois. I felt it go through my whole body. The second event was 45 miles away, and so many years later, and the second one happened after I reported the first one. I don't know what to make of that, but the first event left me feeling a kind of awe, not fear. Initially, it was just fear, of course, but now I just feel that it was a gift to witness that incredible being. I'm sorry for those whose lives were changed, not for the better. I'm incredibly lucky that mine wasn't. My one piece of wisdom that I hope you also get through to all of those who live in fear of them is this. If they wanted you, wanted to hurt you, they could have at any time. No mere walls could keep them out. No human could outrun them. One or two bullets probably wouldn't even slow them down. They are beings living amongst us, and I believe they're smart enough to not want anything to do with us. Can you blame them? I sure can't. Thank you for your time and what you're doing to help others. This is probably too long and or uninspiring for you to share, but it's all fine if you do. I'll just say that I'm now 73 years old, and unburdening myself of these events and getting interested in the community of what others have gone through has helped me so much. If you read all of this, you're even more patient than we thought you were. Sherilyn Franklin. <laughs> Sher Sherilyn Sherry Lynn, that was a great, um, that was a great experience shared to us. We all, I'm sure I'm speaking for everybody, we appreciate you and the time that you took out of your life to share that with us. Um, every email counts. Every, every person counts. And, and these experiences aren't rated. You know, you'll listen to other potential channels say, oh, this is a really good one we have tonight. Or this is a, this is one of our, our favorite ones. You know, favorite one what? What, for entertaining your asses? <laughs> whatever man this isn't it this isn't entertainment this is honest knowledge being shared amongst each other that's all it is and um it sure is painting a clear picture isn't it but i hope that what if i can encourage all of you to do and not to do is don't get stuck in the sasquatch thing don't remain just stuck right here this is just the this is the gate this is the door opener to a shit pile of other things that are going on on this planet that we're not aware of but many are and that is a fact uh, these emails are to help each other get smarter all right and see more clearly so there you go there is another one and as far as the bfro goes i know we uh, that name is getting dragged through the mud um self-deservedly from the from the upper whatever you want to call it, the the man in control 
of that or so-called organization is the dirtbag and is the uh, the number one reason for the bad name and the slagging. I understand there's a lot of good people there. There's a lot of good people everywhere. It's like I've said before, not all researchers. When I do throw shit at them, right? Then they deserve it when they do. Yeah. What else do we got? All right, what do we got going on here? This is Good Morning from Southwestern Wisconsin. I want to say thank you for what you do. You had mentioned many times that your wish for these videos is to get knowledge out to people to explain the experiences they've had. I have two experiences in my life that fit under this description. I am 50 years old now, and the first experience goes back to when I was 12. It was my first year hunting with my father, but alone at the stand. The year before, when I was 11, I went alongside just to observe to get the feel for what it was like. Now at the age of 12, it's my turn to go out with my brothers and father and have my own deer hunting stand. That must have been exciting. I remember the first time I actually got to carry up the big gun, the rifle 30-30, and I was pretty freaked out. It was pretty exciting. He dropped me off, wished me luck, and pointed the direction where he would be about 120 yards away down one side of the hill I was sitting on top of. Being just a boy, the fear of the dark was around, sure, but the excitement was just as powerful, if not more, for the first deer hunt. About 20 minutes in, just about at first light, a tree had come crashing down in the dead silence and scared the living shit out of me. Trying to rationalize this out of nowhere, trying to rationalize this out of nowhere phenomenal sound in my 12 year old mind was possibly a bear. At this time in 1982, south central Wisconsin bears were never in the equation. Though they had been seen, they were exceptionally rare for the area, so it was either a bear or a tree had just decided to come crashing down easily within 30 yards of me. The sense of fear that I had was intense. There was no noise prior to that and no noise after that, but the fear was so incredible I can still remember it now. All these years I chalked it up to it just a 12-year-old boy being afraid. Anyway, back to the story. Since there was deadfall around me, I could not figure out which tree it was that fell. By 8.30 in the morning, the fear was still all around me and I couldn't contain it anymore. My dad told me not to move from the stand unless he shoot a deer. We were out here all day. I could not go get him, out of fear of being yelled at for moving. So all I could do was shoot my 12-gauge into a nearby tree to get his attention and have him come to me. To see him was the most welcome sight I could ever imagine. I made up a story how I seen this deer. I shot at it over there, and we looked around for 45 minutes. There was no blood, so I must have just missed. I never told him the story to this day, but after he had let, left to go back to his stand, the feeling disappeared. I'd been alone, in the dark, whatever, and I felt afraid of the unknown, but nothing like what I experienced that morning. The next experience I had was with my oldest brother. At this time, I was around 42, and my brother was 52. I bought my first cabin on a little piece of land in the same area, I bought my first cabin on a little piece of land in the same area, what about 25 miles due west of the next county over. I invited my brother over for the weekend to check out the property. The first night we took some back roads into the nearest town for some dinner and checked out the nightlife and see what it had to offer. We had left the house around dusk, taken the back roads, and within minutes we were approaching our first stop sign when we heard the most god-awful screeching woman being attacked kind of sound you could ever imagine. I stopped the car. The windows were already down because it was late summer, but still pleasant out. And it happened again. What appeared to be literally 20 yards inside the wood line from where we were parked. My, my brother yelled to get the F out of there. I tore up out of there and a few miles down the road we had to pull over. We were talking about it, maybe coyotes on a fresh kill, but we couldn't, didn't believe it. Couldn't believe it and just never spoke of it. When I got home, I tried researching sounds that it could possibly have been, and I found nothing comparable outside of what people are calling sounds of Bigfoot Sasquatch. That screaming, wailing, was the most haunting sound I will never forget. I still deer hunt to this day, but I'm definitely on guard with my hearing more than my eyes. Watching your videos justifies what I knew to be the truth, but could not rationalize it in my own mind until I heard others speaking of similar stories, so I thank you for that. Keep doing what you're doing, and I'll be watching. Troy Lemert. Okay, Troy, thanks, man. And yeah, obviously, from everybody else's experiences being shared here, you know you're not alone. And those screeches and the terrifying feelings are uh, are quite common. What a what a what a skill that is to be able to 
to impose that kind of fear upon a human being of your choice at any time. What a freaking crazy skill that is. Can you imagine having that? The crazy things that, especially some abusive people, if they could have that skill, imagine what they do to each other. It'd be crazy. But anyway, and there you go. There's a couple more. The one, two, three. I can get. I think I get one more out here. Steve, I spent one year camping in the wilds of the USA. I went to 27 states and I've had several weird experiences. This is a summarization of those events. I went down to the Mexican border. I was going to hike the Arizona Trail. It was the second day I'd set up camp and went to bed. I was using a bivy tarp setup and my tarp was camo. I had a very low profile campsite. The person walking by probably wouldn't have seen it. At about 2 a.m., I was awoken to the craziest screaming I've ever heard. It was a female voice and it was not speaking English. I had no idea what to make of it. I just knew I didn't want to find out what was making that sound. I told myself it was probably sex traffickers or cartels or anything that could have been could be considered normal. The volume of the voice was unbelievable. Fast forward a couple of weeks, I was up near the Gila River and I set up camp on the bank, real close to the water. I never camped near water anymore. I made dinner, watched the sunset, and went into my tent and watched some YouTube. After a while, I heard the sound outside. I heard what sounded like a rock the size of a basketball fall into the river. I thought it was strange, but told myself, it must be a turtle. <laughs> Don't ask me why I thought a turtle could make that sound. A few minutes passed, and I heard what sounded like a palm-sized rock hit the water, and then another, and then another. I got out of my tent thinking fish were jumping, but when I looked, I only saw placid water. It was like glass. I had an uneasy feeling. I couldn't find any reason to be alarmed, so I went back in the tent. Then another huge splash. It was a long night. I was camping in the woods in the Boundary Waters. I set up my camp, made dinner, and went to bed. But the whole time, I was fear-dread. It didn't make sense, because everything was great. After a while, I went into my tent to sleep. About 12 a.m., something woke me up. I don't know what it was. I think something shook my tent, but I didn't wake up fast enough to see or hear it. I was in full-on panic mode, and I don't know why. I went outside the tent thinking maybe a black bear was about. There are wolves too, but these animals avoid people like the plague. I looked around and didn't see anything, but after a few seconds I heard the sound of breathing. It was coming from behind a clutch of bushes. The breathing sounded angry, and I knew whatever it was was making that sound wasn't happy with me. So with all the dignity I could muster, I packed up my camp, got my canoe, and traveled till dawn. I set up camp again and slept most of the day. No further troubles. I was in Oregon, camping deep in the woods near the southern coast. I was sitting in the front of a fire looking at YouTube on my phone when a rock landed between my feet. I thought some kids were messing with me, but I was alone. If you have been to those woods, you know how black it is at night. Douglas fir trees stand 200 feet tall. It's a rainforest. It's thick, it's dark, it's deep. I was alone. I picked up the rock and held it. I marveled at it a while, and then another rock landed almost in the exact spot. The accuracy of the throw was alarming. This time I saw where it came from. I stood up and said, It's all right, buddy. I can take a hint. I'll leave. Again, I packed up and hiked miles in the black at night back to my truck. I cannot say for certain, but I believe I was followed. Whatever it was, moved with all the grace and silence of a shadow. I was camping in the Wintas, Wintas, in Utah. It was sunset and I was chilling, watching YouTube on my phone by the fire, when I heard the most bone-chilling, terrifying howl I have ever even dreamed to imagine. It was unbelievable. Could have stopped my heart. It was about 25 seconds long, and it was like a wolf howl. Look, I've heard every goddamn beast that lives in the woods, and I know what these animals sound like. This was like a wolf-sounding howl, but huge. The sound was indescribably big-sounding. Our guess is only a few hundred yards from me. I didn't see what made that sound, and for that I'm thankful. I never thought of a Bigfoot, and I'd never thought of Dogman. I'm not superstitious. I'm not religious. I don't believe in ghosts. I don't even believe in luck. I'm a straight shooter. These experiences may not seem like a big deal, but I can tell you this. There are things in the woods that we don't understand. Monsters do come out at night. People always told me there is nothing but bears in the woods. I put myself in serious danger by camping and hiking solo based on the advice of people who actually didn't know what they were talking about. These monsters are close to us. 
you don't have to go as far in as I did to run into one. On the Gila River, I wasn't a mile from town. Watch your back out there. Nightmares are real. Keep a brave face, and if you're politely asked to leave, I suggest doing so. Kind regards, Kuro. P.S. Thanks for all you do. I don't care if you say my name, just don't give Bigfoot my email. LOL. <laughs> well, the dreaded shrieks and screams in the night. Nothing to be, uh, nothing to be envied. I got shrieked at, was it last year, I think? Broad daylight, about an hour left of light at the bottom of Mount Curry. And if I can describe it, it almost sounded like a pterodactyl crossed with something. It was just a weird one. I was just setting up the camera, too, to read out some emails. But anyway, there you go. Uh, more people are emailing in and sharing their experiences, which is putting to rest a lot of confusion with a pile of people out there. That's for certain. So if you've got an experience you want to share with everybody, I feel there might be some knowledge in there that might help everybody. Make sure you email it in. We'll get to it at sharemystoryhowtohunt.com or tellmystoryhowtohunt.com. And uh, have a good Christmas out there, everyone. And don't forget, there's going to be somewhere, someone near you who can't wait for this day to go by. And uh, they're going to have a poker face on, but go over there, bring them a plate of Christmas cookies or a drumstick or whatever. Give them a phone call, knock on their door, give them a smile, and make sure they know they count. All right? Mm -hmm.